Okay, let's talk about the readings first um, on Snell's Law and the start of lenses. So, big idea here, and we'll see this again in a different form when we talk next chapter about waves and sound waves and things. What happens to light as it passes from one medium to another that causes its path to bend? So what's actually happening to the light? Okay, it's called refraction, which is number two, but what is happening to it? Right, the speed changes, and whenever a wave goes over a place where its speed changes, its path bends a bit. So we'll actually see that next chapter with waves when we're looking at water waves in a small water pool. When we put something in that makes it shallower, you'll actually see that ref refraction at the uh, edge. I don't want to bring it out now just because it fits better with next chapter. Um, but it's whenever that happens, not just in light, but in any, th any other type of wave as well. Through what medium does light travel fastest? A vacuum. A vacuum. So the, those of you who chose like gas, air, or hydrogen or something, that's really, really close. But the vacuum is what's defined and, and through all of our measurements has been shown to be the fastest. And we compare everything else to that. So air has, yep. Oh, did you find something? I didn't continue, I didn't consider a vacuum as a medium. So you don't have to defend world. yourself, that's okay. <laughs> a medium is, and, and in fairness, if you call it a substance that light would travel through, then that also means that there's no vacuum because it's not a substance. Uh, maybe an area or volume that light can travel through. And since light doesn't need a physical medium, we'd still consider, we'd still usually use that. Fair enough. But what about here's the one that I got a, a couple interesting answers that I don't understand, um, but a lot of other answers that were out of the book that didn't give the highest known index of refraction. What is this metamaterial? We found it online. It didn't say like what it was made of. So it had an index of refraction of 38.6. It seems like it might be sort of a theoretical type thing. I, I've never come across it myself. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, of course. Um, I did a quick search on the interweb. Um, and when I went to Wikipedia, which, by the way, for any social studies teachers watching, is just as accurate as Britannica, um, and a lot quicker. Um, when I looked on this, I knew a couple high ones um, gallium phosphide is something that I worked with in grad school, and it's up at about three point index of refraction of 3.5. But gallium arsenide is even higher, 3.93. This is what all of the lasers in CD players and things are made out of. And then there are just straight germanium is even higher. And I was surprised by this because I don't know if that is even germanium. I it's a metal and or a metalloid, but it looks metallic. And I don't know if that is for all, uh, all wavelengths of visible light or if it's for some other form of electromagnetic radiation. It does have a reference here, but I was not interested enough to follow that reference. Um, so I guess my, my answer would be gallium arsenide, although germanium might also fit in there. And since that is about one quarter the speed of light of the speed of light in a vacuum, it would be somewhere on the order of 7.5 to 8 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So it slows it down quite a bit and bends it a lot. This kind of thing, so this is used, gallium arsenide is used to produce light in lasers and things. Um, gallium phosphide is mostly transparent, so you can actually also make lenses out of that, and gallium arsenide does not work quite as well for it. No, you don't need to know this. This is just go look at something. No, I'm not. I'd never make you remember things like that because you could just now. Now that you remember, you can just use the uh, internet to help you. Okay, Snell's law we talked about in class. So that is the 
n1 times sine theta 1 equals n2 times sine, sine theta 2, just depending on one medium going into the next. And in this case, we would include a vacuum or air or anything as our first medium. Um, the x, number, number x, plain glass can be used as a mirror, even though it appears clear. And most of you noted that some amount of light is reflected off of practically any surface. We can actually coat those surfaces um, so that at least certain colors, certain wavelengths of light won't reflect, they'll all transmit. But in general, it's really, really hard to make something that's a broad spectrum coating like that. So allows all of the colors to go through. So we will still have some reflection. Um, windows in homes are actually kind of reflectively coated to reflect infrared light that we can't see so that it doesn't pass through either way. So it doesn't heat your house in the summer or leak out of your house in the winter as much. Um, but we can also see, use it as a mirror. And so the second part that was not, I think, fully understood by everyone trying to answer is think about when you can see your reflection. So during what time in a mirror in, or in a window and explain why it's visible then, but not at other times. Graham, could you illuminate us? So, I was just thinking about this, and because I guess I look at myself a lot. Of course. Like, um, I, I was thinking about this, and uh, so it, it, it depends on the lighting when like, when it's dark outside, so there's, if there's no light coming in from the outside in, and only the light in the kitchen or wherever you have your um, in a glass, the light comes back. And then you can see yourself because um, because there's only one half of the light. In the right. Window. Yep. So if you look in this mirror or in this window over on the side, you're going to see a reflection because there's no light coming from the other side of the window. The you're going to reflect four to depending on the angle, at least four percent of the light that hits that glass is reflected, and that's enough to see your reflection if there's not other light coming through like in the daytime. So that's what I meant by that, but that was obviously in, uh, a lot of you had talked about the when as, as the angle changes, which is a fair interpretation. Why do uh, some waves of, of uh, the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum carry heat, like infrared or is it just They infrared? all carry energy. We feel infrared as heat there and and the infrared part of the spectrum I don't know if you've got I can bring it up the infrared part of the spectrum is actually quite broad and we can sense a lot of that as <coughs> and so while we see only a very very tiny portion of it I can make that big Um, so here's the whole spectrum. All of the waves behave just like all the rest. Uh, you know, so so we. Well, no, that's not what I wanted. The different types of waves behave each other like each other, but yeah, um, although they interact with material quite differently, just depending on their energy and their wavelength. So if this is the whole spectrum, we only see a tiny, tiny fraction of it. So the amount of energy held in that whole part of the spectrum is relatively low compared to infrared, which is what we define as that much. And we can feel much of that as heat. So it's just that it's that much wider. We're sensing the energy in it where we wouldn't sense the energy using our skin in this little sliver of visible light. There's just a lot greater intensity in other parts. Does that ex help explain? It's a little. Okay. Can you can you probe with your questions? Well, I mean, I'm wondering why, like, why can't we feel like X-rays or microwaves? Okay. So um, X-rays, we we can't feel, although we can detect if there is. Usually, there's just not very many of them. They're very high energy. Um, we can detect them because parts of our body start to deteriorate and cause cancer. 
but the inner the the general um, intensity of those is so little that we don't feel them passing through us. They're, they're quite few and far between. If they were intense, we could feel it. It would damage cells rapidly and we could feel that. Um, microwaves and radio waves are actually so long that they tend not to interact with anything that they're going through. That's why we could turn on a radio in here or you can many of you can use your phones because the radio waves can actually travel through a lot of other stuff. They, because of the, of the long wavelength, they don't have as many opportunities to interact with the material they're going through. Um, these can be radio, microwaves and radio waves can be anywhere from you know, centimeters in wavelength to kilometers in wavelength. Visible light is nanometers, it's sort of scale. So it's a lot more likely to interact with anything that it touches, which is why we've got so many things that appear opaque. The light can't go through them. Radio waves, microwaves can. Infrared, infrared waves can better than light, but still they're short enough that they interact quite a, a bit, which is what we feel as heat that's interacting with our skin and we're absorbing that energy. Uh, the waves are transferring energy onto our skin. And our skin. Right, okay. light waves are a way to transfer energy through electric and magnetic interactions. Yeah. Um, gravitational waves are the way to transfer energy through gravity. So we think that every force has a corresponding particle and wave where we just aren't able to detect quite all of them. We just, scientists just recently detected the first gravitational waves. And they think, what was it, two, two black holes collided or something like that? And they detected the uh, waves rippling out from it. So every force is a wave? Every force transfers its energy in a wave and has a corresponding particle with that wave. So photons for light. It's a, it's a particle of the energy. So gravity has a particle. Called a graviton. We haven't detected them yet, but we think they're there. The stronger the force, the easier it is to detect the particle. We can detect photons very easily because the electromagnetic force is so strong. We can detect particles of the nuclear forces because they're strong. The gravity is so weak in comparison that it's very hard to detect. A little bit off topic, but good physics anyway. Next one, well, explain why a pencil stuck into a glass of water appears to bend even though the pencil is straight. So these next two questions are related to each other here. If you are an observer on the outside or on, on the uh, up above, you've got uh, light rays going straight from this uh, um, into your eye. And that works perfectly normal. If you, so let's put our eye up above. That's an eye. Staring into the soul of the water. <laughs> so any light ray leaving the uh, pencil from above can go straight in. <coughs> but any light ray down coming from the water is going to be bent at the water's interface. That was a really poor bending. I did it the wrong way. Right? So the light seems to be coming from a place. If we trace this part straight back, it appears to be coming from a different place. Same thing happens if you look at something right underwater. You've got the surface of the water there and we're looking at something underneath. A light ray leaving this, the snow block, since the index down here of water, 1.33, and air is about 1.00, it's going to bend farther away. And if we're, and same thing on the other side. So if we actually, this is the part of the ray that we can see, if we trace these back, that point appears to be a lot shallower just because that's the way our mind automatically works. 
ียมแบบ You want it in the office, but I'm not done with you yet. Um, and then the last one on this page: What is total internal reflection? And most of you defined that. I thought it would be interesting, though, to see it in action. Um, this is not exactly how fiber optics work. It's it is a bit more complicated, but it's that kind of idea. Um, you can do this on surface of the water. So if you've got an aquarium and shine a laser pointer in through the side. You can see different angles where it will start to re it'll it'll shine up on the ceiling, but then at a certain angle of this, it will actually reflect all the way back. And this very large, very crude um, tube or fiber can illustrate it too. So it's solid plastic, and I will keep this out so you can look at it later. Um, if I put this at a high angle. Uh, maybe maybe both lights. Can we get both lights off now for a sec. If we put this at the right angle, we'll see the laser going through and interacting with the um, parts of the plastic. So we've got we can kind of see it light up and it reflects near my left hand and it goes up and around and you can see a lot of the light coming out the end. But now, as I increase my angle here, you can see the beam changing shape, sh changing directions, and at some point, it's going to stop reflecting. I might have to go way up here. It stops reflecting internally now. It doesn't transfer through the whole thing, and it just goes through the plastic. But if I keep it less than that angle, it's going to totally. Uh, reflect internally, and this comes from Snell's law. Okay, light back on again, please. This comes from Snell's law because if you've got an interface here, and we have say water underneath, we've got air up above, and we're going to start in the water. So I'll call that one and that two. Shine a light up here. We've got our normal here and our angle theta one. This is going to refract to theta two at some point. It's going to be larger because it's going into a lower uh, index of refraction. But if we set up the math. We've got n1. If we want to find this angle, we've got n1 over n2 times the sine of theta one. At some point, sine theta two. Because this is more than one. At some angle for theta, we're going to get to the point where this uh, product is one. That's called the critical angle down here. At some angle of theta one, this is going to be so large that there's no solution for theta two, because sine can't be more than one. And so, at this critical angle, it instead. Now that would just be. Call this a critical angle, theta c. It starts refracting at 90 degrees, so it gets to a maximum, and then after that, it doesn't ref it doesn't go through anymore. It just reflects. It can't solve. You can't solve um, Snell's law for it, for it anymore. That's a little bit of a confusing one. Any questions on total internal refraction or reflection? Okay, I think we've got a question on it. So. We'll try and do that. Okay, and then number four I wanted to talk about too. It says compare and contrast concave and convex lenses with concave and convex mirrors. In particular, compare the type of images each makes and under what condition the comparisons hold. Table of information may be useful of organizational tool. This will actually be this will actually keep for just a little while because 
let's talk about <coughs> the last lab that we did, lab F on convex lenses and their images. And then we'll come back to this and make those comparisons. Um, from what I saw, people were getting through it pretty easily and finding, lo and behold, not only does this formula work for a mirror, we come up with the same relationship when we're talking about lenses. And this, to be clear, is called a thin lens law or formula. And thin is important. Thin means it's not, the, the center of the lens is relatively thin compared to its diameter. When you get lenses that are bowed out a lot more at the side, it doesn't work anymore. This formula won't, won't uh, work anymore. We're not gonna look at too many of those, at least not where it's clear that this would work. We will be able to when we start talking with the matrices. Um, but this is actually really good for most of the lenses that we occur, we see in our normal everyday lives from glasses to even eye lenses is pretty close approximation to it and even when you get something that's really really curved it works out well if you can confine the light to just the center of the lens so our our eyes are fairly curved um, and it this would not work well if we've got a whole bunch of light flooding in but it does actually still work out well, if we just say, okay, let's just take a little bit of the center part of the lens, because that's not as curved in there. It starts to flatten out. Also, you found magnification looks very similar. It would be the height of an image over the height of the object, as always. And that turns out in the same way as before, mirrors, to be negative one times the image distance over the object's distance. And just like before, this negative means that it would be, in, if magnification is negative, the image is inverted, it's upside down. What did you see when, with this in mind, and now thinking of our question, one kind of lens is very similar to one kind of mirror. Which lens is similar to which mirror? Uh, biconvex is similar to a concave mirror. Right, convex lens, and very often, I'll just use the term convex, but we're looking at the simple type that are the same both ways. Convex lens is basically, or, or at least for mathematical purposes and, and what we'll see in drawing purposes, very, very similar to a concave mirror. Okay, well, what do we know about concave mirror and the images they form? Are they real? Are they always real? No. Well, they can form real images. When do they form real images? Yeah. Out, yep. If the object distance is greater than the focal length and that's true for both you probably saw that going in that at some point um, the with the lens close enough to the object it's no longer a real image but it is now flipped and or it's it's upright and it's larger it's magnified magnified so that's how he's magnifying by and that would be our virtual image the object distance is less than the focal length. What else can we say about some of these images? What's that? Upside down when? When it's a real image. Yeah. So in this case, it's also inverted. What would we say about it when it's a virtual image? upright. What would we say about its size in either case? For virtual images, it's magnified. Magnified for virtual images. Yeah. 
and we say it's demagnified for, for real images. We actually saw when drawing that not always. Um, it tend it works out that if the I think it's the object distance is greater than twice the focal length, image is smaller, so demagnified. If it's in between one and two f, it's actually magnified. This is not something I'd expect you to just be able to spit out. Probably something that if, if I gave you, I said sketch it or calculate it, you should be able to figure it out, but not something you would just know. So those things are true. Um, what about then the other type? The other type of lens, concave lens, convex mirror. Oh, what's another term for these two types of lens or mirror? What do they do with the light? They convert. Okay, what about these two? Diverging. What kind of images do they form? When? Always. Always. What can we say about those images? Upright or inverted or does it change? Always up. Larger or smaller images than the object. What's that? Monthly angle. I don't know. Smaller. Smaller. Okay. Demagnified or smaller. Now the differences between them a lens and a mirror come in where the light actually goes and where a new image forms. So let's talk a little bit about that. I've set up a demo. I don't know if it will work. Um, it used to, but that was a lot. That was when the um, the original light sources that came with the kit were still functional. So I am. Um, not overly optimistic that my new light box will work that well. Uh, basically what it is, in here there's a bulb with the mirrors to reflect as much light, and then there are two, I'll show you in a sec, two slots where the light will leave the box. The idea is with a proper lens, you can set this up as a ray that we'll be able to see on the board. The angles are now, they might work out. I've only had a moment to try it because this is the, my second or third attempt to make it work and possibly last. Um, can we please get the lights up in the back because this is a, since it's not working perfectly, we have to dim it as much as possible. Okay, so on the board, we can start to see, and if I move my little lenses here, yeah, that's not gonna work. Not very well. We can start to see the rays, and this is what we'd like to trace, the ones on the board. Um, there, that one looks better. Because then we can start to put other neat things in front of it and see what happens. And we'll do our best, at least with a couple here. This is a convex plano lens. So it's convex on one side, but a plane on the other, that still t tends to work like our convex lenses. So parallel rays come in and then they converge towards a point, focal point back here. Um, the unfortunate part is the older ones 
they were a bit brighter and easier to see. We can, we can see it, and as my eyes adjust, I can see a little better, but not perfectly. Let's see what else we've got. We've got some convex lens. Sorry, concave. And we can see what happens to the light rays there. Maybe if I move this closer, it'll be more obvious. They hit the hit parallel but diverge away. I can see really faint ones here that are up from some of the reflections and secondary bending, but you see most of it bending away. So if you were to use both the concave and a, a, a concave plano lens and a convex plano lens, would you get a parallel line again? So if we put two up here, I'll, I'm going to try and just stand off to the side. So these two don't quite fit. Let's see if I've got a matching pair. Here we are. So that sort of nest, you said, right? Well, not nested, but like spread apart. Oh, oh okay. Well, here is the nested ones, and they go straight. If we Yeah. So they will tend to counteract each other. This is actually what happens very much in most of our eyes. If you are nearsighted, what happens is you've got, we all have lenses, converging lenses in our eyes. Our retina would be back towards here. And in perfect vision, our retina would be right at that focal point. But what actually happens is as we age, and this happens usually as a child, uh, in this case, the the eye grows a little oblong. So instead of our retina being right here where they meet, it's actually back here. That's why we call it nearsighted because this focus is happening too close to the um, too close far forward. I think I'm getting this the right way. Um, and so we need something to help diverge. So yeah, I am confident now. We need actually these to diverge a little bit before they even hit our lens so that the correction that our lens is doing puts it back on the retina rather than in front. So if you are nearsighted, you actually get glasses that are a type of concave lens. This is an exaggerated version, but oh, let's, if I diverge it first, then we see that the light going through the second lens are representing our eye is a lot more parallel and done correctly of course then this diverges it just enough to get it to focus back on the retina we actually use that type really frequently we've got just a straight prism in here so that when we put light on it we can see and you did this in the lab um, where you get an angle going through it and then it straightens back out as it exits. When you were What's that? Did you get this from when you were No, this was here when I got here. It's quite old. I think this kit is older than me. So the fact that it has burnt out lamps is not really a surprise. Um, mirrors, we have a convex mirror that is bouncing it back at an angle. Tougher to see since there's so much light over there, but we can see it even up on the ceiling, bouncing away, or concave mirror focuses it right here at the um, focal point. So a neat kit, unfortunately not at its prime right now. Um, I'll probably continue to spend slash waste time trying to fix that. And hopefully someday I will. We get the one light back again. That's neat, but what I want to know is, or what we need to be able to do then is apply this knowledge like we have with mirrors to be able to ray trace where images are going to form from our lenses. And you're going to see that this is actually similar to what we got with the mirrors, but in my experience, it's a bit easier and a bit more uh, accurate than what we had with mirrors because we're dealing only with thin lenses that have very little curvature.
So we're going to start out and we're going to look at a convex, biconvex lens. Ray trace. And as before, we'll have our optical axis through here. Now the a lens, we're going to represent with just a single line. And because this is convex and it bows out in the center, we put little arrows pointing away from the center to show that. So they're sort of the tips of the curve and then it would curve out like this. But it's still pretty thin. Uh, I'm going to put a focal point here and try and get an equal distance behind it because for a lens, the lenses that we are dealing with, the focal points will be the same on both sides. It's perfectly reasonable to make a lens that isn't the same on each side so the focal lengths would change, but we are not going to deal with that. So I'm at 28, put another one at 28. So there are my focal points. Two focal points for a lens rather than just the one of a mirror. And I'm going to, as before, put an object up here. We learned three rules for mirrors. We're going to learn three rules for different rays from lenses as well. And they're very similar to their corresponding uh, mirror. So if we take the first one and we have a parallel ray, what did a parallel ray do with our concave mirror? Who went back through a focal point. Now, a mirror, of course, reflects the light back towards the left. Light always goes from left to right, by the way. It's a joke, but not, not a great one, I get it. Okay. Um, but of course, in lenses, they're actually traveling through. So this ray will be bent and go through the focal point. I'll summarize these after I've done. If we had a light ray that hit the center of our mirror, what would happen to it? So it would reflect at the same angle. Yeah. This is going to go past through the lens, and just like we saw with, our, with the slabs, although it gets bent a little tiny bit in the lens, the lens is very thin, so it doesn't change the course very much. And then on the other side, continues at the same angle. So this one, see if I can get it. Nope. This one is going to continue straight through the center. And you've probably already noted where the uh, where the image is going to form. And then the last one goes through the focal point. Con if this were a concave mirror and it went through the focal point, how would it reflect? Parallel to the normal. Parallel. This bends it. This refracts it parallel to the normal. Pretty close. You can, your drawings can be closer even than this, as long as you're careful measurement. They can be right on. And our image forms there. Okay, so the same rules that we had on, on the other one. Um, parallel rays. refract through the far uh, focal point. A ray to the center of the lens passes through unchanged. Finally, 
I'll, I'll put it back when it's all ready. A ray through the near focal point. so it's parallel to the optical axis. And I should say parallel rays, that's to the optical axis. Done with you. All right. Well, we're in class the whole day.